starting the They have to be the pepperless for to be in the can hit, but I hear some matates. Ooh, the sand is deep right here. Last time on Across the Mojave, I stumbled down the Chuckawalla Mountains beneath the darkening sky in a hunger-fueled delirium about tacos. Oh, we're a nice El store right now. The next day, I would need to look for water to spring again in a remote canyon for which I could find no trip reports more recent than the 90s. Then, I need to finish crossing the little visited east end of Joshua Tree National Park before getting to my next food drop at Highway 62. From there, I would start a long and sandy trek across almost 40 miles of open desert before I could look for my next watering hole in the Old Woman Mountains. All right, well, finally we can camp. Nothing down right between those rocks there. Nice, well, I don't know if gravel's that soft, but it's kind of soft. Heading now in the just as dawn breaks down towards the freeway. In a moment, I'll climb out of the canyon and figure out exactly where I'm crossing underneath the freeway. I'm going to go through one of the drainage ditches. Okay, sun has risen. So it's definitely far to the interstate because it's so big. Um, we we'll finally reached the defensive earthworks around the interstate. This is one of the diversion ditches for out here in the desert when it rains it pours. And so they're big flash floods from time to time and so they put up these big earthen diversion dikes to funnel all the flood waters towards a few little bridges. And so I think I'm heading for that next bridge up there. Basically directly the way my shadow is playing. It looks like the ambulance across the barbed wire fence. Actually, no. No, I don't. Someone has completely cut it right here. Probably someone who thinks there could be a wildlife corridor here. So that animals can pass. Otherwise, it's massive ecosystem. The animals can't get from one side to the other. Hmm. Oh, this doesn't look so bad. I heard we're gonna have to even duck. Okay, I have to duck a little bit. Oh, oh my bag kicked up. Okay. Ah, uh, new strategy. Take the bag off. It's really hard to duck long enough to hold the bag upright so the end. Walking like this. I'm afraid things are falling my bag. Oh, that tip over too far. Oh, this is fine. Still probably had to duck a little bit with the bag, but I guess I could have put it back on rather than carrying it like this. Oh well. Okay. I don't know if I put my bag back on. This is not a consistent way of turning. But then the fence is not down on the side. A couple metal blue birds just randomly stuck in the gravel. Um, you know, interesting people live in the desert. I guess interesting people also hike 500 miles across it. So I can't really be one to talk. Okay, so here we're coming up on the old grade of the Eagle Mountain Railway. There's this little gravel and dirt berm in front of us. Um, this called ore from the from Kaiser Steel's uh, Eagle Mountains Mine, which is just back around the corner of the mountains that way, uh, from 1948 to 1986, uh, at which point it shut down due to plummeting steel prices. Um, but part of the... Uh, Mining Town's uh, legacy lives on as the Kai um, Kaiser Permanente Healthcare started out as the um, sort of company town health system uh, back at the ghost town over there at, at Eagle Mountain 
uh, but it lives on now as, as the Kaiser, Kaiser Permanente Healthcare System, which my family and I are actually served by, and has gone on to become a worldwide model for um, health maintenance organizations, uh, where you know it's a combination of insurance and the healthcare. So there's there's incentive for them to keep you healthy. Um, but they took the uh, apparently the rails were still here until. 2017 um, because they were originally planning to reuse the open the big open pit as a landfill and use the train to carry waste out from Los Angeles. It was shut down by environmental protests so they pulled this up the tracks. I guess that's just five years ago now so. Okay, well unfortunately I just realized I went to change my GoPro batteries and realized that I had left the battery charger on the mountain somewhere way back up there and that along with it were my two only charge batteries other than the one I put in right now. So I have one battery for the next two days until I can get a resupply. Uh, so you might be seeing a little bit less of me. Uh, okay, that said, the, the plan for today now is I'm getting close up to these mountains here, the Eagle Mountains, and the front of them is not in the wilderness area. The front of this mountain, the front of the next mountain. So I'm gonna have to go up to the top basically go along there's sort of a plateau on top and then come back down and then go back over that second ridge there and then that far canyon you can see there's a spring a hayfield spring and i'll be heading to that one this is where i'll hopefully get by the end of the day jackrabbit just jumped out of the bush at me hey jackrabbit passing now over the colorado river aqueduct right here is a buried cut and cut and cover aqueduct if you look this way you can see where it uh, it runs right beneath us and then it would have gone into a tunnel there where the rock is blasted. Although, the, again, the actual aqueduct is buried. But the Colorado River Aqueduct uh, was constructed in the 1930s. Uh, and it's, two, it's a 242-mile system of tunnels, um, cut-and-cover aqueduct, open-water aqueduct, and siphons. Um, you know, it spanned the 242 miles and carried 45 cubic meters of water. Um, they come, it comes from Parker Dam. Uh, along the Colorado River at, at Lake Havasu, which was the dam was constructed for the purpose of building this aqueduct um, And it was built in the 30s and this was the largest such syst aqueduct system built at that time um, uh, It was built during the, the depression as part of the work protection act uh, and it employed uh, over 30,000 workers over the course of its construction uh, up to 10,000 workers at any given time um, so it's an impressive system, though here it's buried mostly, so all you can see is a few skew scars and piles of rock. Okay, next I just need to go up that mountain. I think what I need to do here is basically go up to the top of this rock pile, and then turn right up towards that gap. The top of the rock pile is approximately where I'll enter Joshua Tree National Park and Wilderness. Okay, so I've come up now up the boulder pile. Uh, basically, the top of the boulder pile, you can now see the open air parts of the Colorado River Canal pretty easily now. Uh, also, at this point, I'm now at the elevation where I think I'm about to enter uh, Joshua Tree National Park. Uh, incidentally, Joshua Tree National Park, uh, Death Valley National Park, and Enzo Borrego National Park are all preserved today largely thanks to the conservation efforts of Minerva Hoyt uh, back in the early 20th century. Um, one complicated thing about entering the national park here, uh, away from any park station, it's a little hard to pay the fee, especially when you're on foot. And I'd have to do a 25 mile round trip hike to, to go past the entrance. And fortunately, I just went and stopped by uh, a few weeks ago and bought myself an annual interagency pass. So I don't have to worry about park fees when I enter the parks. Uh, and so from here, I just, uh, I think I'm gonna go up and then angle over to the right, up to the ridge there, and then follow the ridge up. Uh, but probably I'll just do whatever looks easiest when I get there. See you at the top. Okay, you just come up this steep part, up onto this uh, shoulder of the ridge. And now we just need to keep going up. I think maybe if I go to the right, it will be easier than going up this spine. See you guys in the top. I'm now more legitimately up on the ridge top. And so I'm just gonna follow this ridge along more or less horizontally till I get to that gap over there, I think. Although I'll probably check the map one more time before I do anything brash. But then at that point, I will be past the point where the feet of the mountains are outside of the National Park and Wilderness. 
and then I can go back down the mountain for a little while and walk across the alluvium. Incidentally, basically all of these boulder mazes you see in Joshua Tree National Park are all, you know, broadly speaking, granite. Okay, so we finally reached our jump off point where we have to drop down into the abyss here. Uh, I'm going to go across the little bit of alluvial fan there and back behind that knob that sticks out and through that little gap. Then I follow the front, the top of the alluvial fan across to the next big canyon, and then a mile up that is our spring for tonight, Hayfield Spring. Incidentally, in the far background, you can see Mount San Jacinto, which is, I think, about 10,500 feet high. Down here in the wash, there's some beautiful desert lupins. Our last little summit like this of the day, but we do have to climb up a big canyon still. Um, but from now on, we can stay within the Joshua Tree National Park and Wilderness boundary without too much difficulty. Look at the size of those boulders. You would not want to camp at the bottom of this slope during an earthquake. Those are, well, at least that big one is the size of a house. A small house. That one's way out there. Okay, well now I'm making my way through this extremely windy gap. Just trying to pick out which of these canes in the far side I'm aiming for. I need to walk a little bit closer before I can tell. About that last bit, my voice gets high when it's cold and all of a sudden an icy arctic blast of wind came at me right then. Anyway, I decided that I'm heading for the gap up here, just left of those rocks there. Uh, I think the main gap of Hayfield Canyon is there, but I don't look like this saves some time. We'll see if that's the case or not. It sounds like the bottom of Hayfield Canyon is actually kind of rocky from descriptions of people who go up there to see the petroglyphs, which are apparently there. Looks like maybe there's a little bit of remains of a camp up here. I guess these are the foundations maybe of a small wooden shack, which is now lying in tattered pieces around. Piece of an old China plate. And here we come to Hayfield Canyon. Uh, and here's just a question of how to get down. Well, I haven't seen the petroglyphs reputed to be in this canyon yet, but I hear some matates, holes for grinding various seeds and things like that. Probably mesquite beans or seeds. I guess they're they're beans. I think they're legume. Mesquite beans probably being a popular one. I heard even cat claw beans can be ground up into paste and they're nutritious but yeah just a more of the continuing boulder maze oh there's some petroglyphs up on that rock let's go take a closer look I want to climb through the cat claw here but yeah definitely some petroglyphs up there here's a piece of mangled iron pipe Evidence of some ultimately futile effort to harness water from the spring. We're an ambitious pipe project up here. And another looming cascade of house sized boulders. Uh, well, fun fun. Okay, there's the end of the pipe. And I decided that with the pack I'm wearing and without a buddy to spot me, I can't go up it. So I'm going to try and go around. Okay, well, the next patch of stream doesn't look so bad, at least. Well, I really hope there's water at this spring. I got enough that I could make it back out of here tomorrow, but I just don't want to traverse this canyon that second time. I don't know, boulder in front up to a certain size. <sighs> This shortcutting around waterfalls is this is the sort of thing that takes a lot of energy out of you. Well, I was just thinking it's another few hundred meters to uh, the spring. Uh, this actually doesn't fit this prison. I think this is just a little tank left over from last time it rained, but you can always come back and get this water if there's no water further up. That looks like plenty for what I need. And it even looks clear. It's got some scum on top, but great. I'm still going to look to see if I can find the, the described well. The described well, or spring I should say, Hayfield Spring, it should be again another corner or two around the canyon. 
It is described as water coming out of a, uh, as a, coming out of a tunnel on the side of the canyon. Um, it's also known as Anschutz Well in some old maps, which is in the same place, so I infer it's the same thing. Uh, and presumably they call it a well because it's, you know, sort of like a horizontal well. Just look closely at where this is, so I need to find it again if I need to, if I do need to come back and get the water down there. I did hear one thing saying that the tunnel was overgrown by uh, thorn bushes. So my guess is that if there is a tunnel, the original tunnel is now just totally overgrown by these thorn bushes. Um, and I'd probably, if there wasn't water in that other little hole down there, it's actually not that far down. I think it's probably, it's basically just spring water that's seeping up in a different place. I said tank earlier, that really wasn't the right word. Um, my guess is that back in the day, people used to tend wherever the entrance to the spring was, uh, prune back the bushes and things like that. Here, this one I already, this one I already filled. Perfectly basically fine. It has a slightly moldy taste, I guess I would say to it, but um, presumably anything super bad is being filtered out, so that should be good. Okay, well I'm really glad some of the springs on this trip are going to work out. Uh, tiny bit of daylight left, so I'm just going to hike up the canyon a little bit, see if I can find a good place to camp. Like I say, it's not good practice to camp right next to spring because it scares off the wildlife. And right here is not a super great place to camp anyway, to be quite honest. Okay, well there is the sunset, and I decided to make this little sandy patch in the canyon home. Again, it would be a terrible place if, a, if there was a flash flood hazard, but there aren't any clouds in the sky, there's zero percent chance of precipitation. And that looks like a nice place to lay my bed. One thing is that when out we're in the uh, National Park, there's no campfires allowed outside of designated campfire areas. So, um, no bacon tonight, uh, but on the plus side, I can get dinner a lot sooner because I don't need to cook anything. I, I pre-baked all my bread last night. I'm just going to take my vegetable powder and mix it in cashew butter. The idea is it's sort of like, uh, in some like recipes for palak paneer, they use cashews to thicken it. So I was thinking that maybe cashews mixed with a, you know, spinach kale powder would be palatable. We'll find out. There is the first glow of sunrise as I start to take down my camp. Okay, a little past dawn now. It's hard to get a quick start on these cold mornings, but I'm ready to continue bouldering up this canyon into the further into the Eagle Mountains. The goal today is basically to finish crossing the Eagle Mountains to get to the other side, and they're actually a pretty wide range, so it'll take me a little while. Okay, well, I've made it up another quarter mile from camp, and the boulders are getting thinner, and the sun has come out. So, what more could I ask for, other than less wind? Maybe a little bit warmer, but the sun is going to work on that, so. It's just more charming than challenging, but. It's a fun little collection of boulders, nice little cave down there underneath that big boulder. Maybe you should have looked for a hole like that to camp in last night. <sighs> I'm tall, I like to be able to stand up. Okay, so I was just examining this next boulder puzzle here. Well, I saw way up on the rock there, uh, this sort of eagle-shaped rock. You can see there's some petroglyphs. So I'll have to digitally zoom, but this is 4K now, so hopefully that'll work. Because the Eagle Mountains, it's appropriate to have the eagle-shaped rock. Anyway, onwards and upwards. The canyon certainly isn't getting any easier. Well, I'll confess, I actually came around this waterfall rather than up it. So that brings it out to a nice opening with uh, another choice. Uh, this time I think I'm going to again take the right fork. I just turned off my uh, camera. Uh, you can see there are actually some more petroglyphs here. And these ones might be newer. They look hard to say. But there are definitely some petroglyphs here that are petroglyphy. I actually was supposed to take the left back of the petroglyph, so we'll just head back that way and uh, continue up that canyon. I didn't overshoot it by much. 
Well, here I went back and turned up the petroglyphs. This canyon at least does not appear to widen right away, but it's okay. So far it's still, oh, that's too narrow for my bag. Uh, okay, wasn't too bad. But it's still pretty traversable, so. A cool little water collar tunnel through the granite there. I don't feel possessed to crawl through that right now though. Okay, so now we're really up on a little plateau or the, well, we'd probably call it a moor if we were in England, if we're coming up with a, with a peak, but um, I just have to figure out which way I'm heading. You sort of lose your navigational things on the map once you get up on a flat plane like that. Continuing on my way, on my merry way here, got a better view of where I'm heading towards. Sort of between that rocky spar on the left and then where those other mountains come down on the right. Still nice boulder field. Which is not a technical term, by the way. If I had to come up with a technical term, I'd probably call it a pediment, meaning a bedrock surface that's been planed off by the action of streams. In this case, it's a pediment that then the sediment has been washed off the top to reveal the boulders below. In many cases, a pediment surface has a thin layer of uh, stream wash on top of it, so you can't really tell it's there. So actually, this that covering plain might well also be a pediment. And one way you can tell is in the little, in every little canyon, you'll see granite down at the bottom of the canyon, and then the middle of between the canyons, you won't see anything. But there's just a very thin layer of alluvium on top of the bedrock. And basically, the bedrock has been planed down at the level of the streams and no further to make a nice flat surface. <laughs> you do not secretly turn back on in the pocket. I've reached what I think is my high point of the day. A windy little gap here, but it's coming up this little canyon past that pointy rock. We're seeing the back of it there. And I just straight down this little bit of that gap down there. There's a desert tortoise carapace. Poor guy didn't make it. Good shape, too. Yeah. My GPS informs me now at the edge of the wilderness boundary. You can now see a road right ahead of us. Um, this is the Black Mountain Mine Road. So we're now outside the wilderness uh, because there's a little corridor around this road. For some reason, the corridor is wider on the north than on the south. We have about 500 meters to go across non-wilderness until we get back out of it. Um, sort of right before we get to that mountain right in front of us, uh, then we're back in the wilderness. So. Uh, part of the reason for our route being precisely here is because this is, there's some places where it's more than 500 meters across. This is sort of one of the places where it's the shortest gap. We just tossed a second road and the GPS now tells me I'm back in the wilderness. I guess I'm probably about 25 feet away from the road now. So now I just need to cut around the corner of this mountain without getting any closer to the road and then see where I'm heading off that way. Okay, I'm just coming around the side of this little mountain that I just uh, got to after crossing the road. And I think I'm heading for the low gap right up there, which is two or three miles, depending on where you count the end point as. Where you count the end point is where I turn left after the ridge or the end of the loop and before it. Um, now, this looks easy enough from here, but from my recollection of the topo map, there's a lot of canyons I need to go up and down up through. So um, I'm expecting this is actually to be quite of a bit of a pain. Basically stuff like this continuously for the next two miles at least. Uh, I'm probably not going to film all of it because I don't have that much battery. Okay, so the sun is now chasing me across the, the second alluvial fan of doom. And now the crest, as I crest this fan, it's actually now downhill to another drainage. The alluvial fan is that big, it's actually the divide itself. Um, so then I think I'm going to go down this drainage between the, the gray mountain on the left and then the red mountain in the background. Okay, so I'm just coming across the alluvial fan out there, down this canyon. Now the time has come for me to go over one last pass which is there, and there it'll be downhill to my camp the whole way. For reals. And not too far either, just a mile or, mile or two from here. Something like that. Okay, well I'm coming up to the final summit of the Eagle Mountains. And then it's just going to be down, I think, the right-hand canyon here. Crossing this little canyon here, I noticed some iron ore hematite. You can see by the red streak there where I scraped against the rock, um, which is iron, three-plus oxide, uh, major ore of uh, iron. And that makes sense because we're about a mile west of the east end of the Kaiser um, Eagle Mountain Mine. They used to 
mine iron from. So this is probably just a little offshoot of the same vein that caused that. Starting to get some nice light out there in the valley. The sun gets low. Well, if I'm racing against the uh, sunset, it appears I'm going to lose, but it should stay light for another 20 or 30 minutes, which should get me out of this canyon. Probably not the first time I've been racing with the light down what canyon like this. Just come out of the canyon finally, and uh, out to the Pinto Basin. So there's the Pinto Mountains there, and so tomorrow I just need to, well, I need to start by walking 10 straight miles to the to the east end of the Pinto Mountains. Uh, right now I just need to find a place to camp. Okay, uh, well, heading out now from my camp at the foot of the Eagle Mountains. And we're going to head out into the sunrise towards the corner of the Pinto Mountains out there. So I just removed my Nutella bread. So it's probably going to be a long, boring walk. Not much to see, but I also don't have a lot of battery left. So see you guys in a bit. You might say I'm starting a straight line mission of sorts. It's, it's actually 17 kilometers or a little over 10 miles to the point of the Pinto Mountains there. So uh, I'm not going to use a GPS or anything to try and follow a line, but we'll see how straight of a line I can get. Here's an explanation of my method recorded during a practice straight line back on day six of my hike. Basically, I was just walking towards a point on the horizon. To help keep my line straight, so that I'm just sitting on the mountain, and also picking out trees that are between me and the mountain along my path. That way, if I wander back and forth to get bushes, if I get that tree line back up with the mountain, then I can verify that I'm still on a straight path. So it's a sort of a low-tech straight line mission without using GPS. Pretty sunrise lights on the Pinto Mountains. I'm still heading towards the end, which is still not much closer. The hazard of certain parts of the desert is that there are these animal burrows, and you're just walking along and all of a sudden, blah, you fall into one. <sighs> that part of the valley was easy, but this sort of bumpy bouldery stuff where I can't even see the horizon and I have to climb up in those canyons. This is what's going to ruin my line. Or maybe not. In hindsight, I was only 11 meters off the line at that time. So I started near the west end of the Eagle Mountains, way down there, I think more than nine miles uh, back. And then I've come across... And that's when my last GoPro battery finally died after two days of service. Anyway, I've almost come up to the corner of... This is on my iPhone now. I've almost come up to the corner of the Pinto Mountains here. Okay, so I finally made it to the uh, corner of the um, Pinto Mountains here. You can barely see the Eagle Mountains in the background there. Since I hadn't looked at my GPS all morning, I didn't really think my line would have come out all that well. And after deviating for a whole bunch of canyons, I figured my chances of getting even a silver run that is less than 100 meters deviation from a straight line would be shot. So I was totally flabbergasted when I just recently input my line into scoremyline.com and found that I had 89% Burdell score uh, on the pro setting and a maximum deviation of 19 meters on a nearly 17 kilometer line. That's a platinum run. Get in! Okay, so from here, I basically go straight ahead into that plain and uh, Highway 62 should be up there in about four miles or so. Can't quite see any cars from here, but uh, and that's where I'll get resupplied with food and water and clothes and GoPro batteries. Um, and it's also where I'll leave Joshua Tree National Park and Wilderness and enter the Sheep Hole Mountains Wilderness. So, and then I'll have uh, GoPro batteries. I can go back to using the GoPro. Okay, so now just coming to the boundary of Joshua Tree National Park and Wilderness. And I think that's actually just my parents growing up. Yeah, road pose, no vehicle, National Park Service. So now we're officially out of the park and wilderness and are ready for our resupply. Sorry, I'm not very good at filming with the iPhone. Thank you guys for bringing me stuff. Okay. Great. Okay, so now we are here. Um, we're in a little wilderness camp here. And I just need to walk out across the road about as far as that fence back there is on the other side until I get back into a wilderness area and then I'll be um, just looking for cars here 
Is that a motorcycle? I guess so. Okay, uh, so I'm gonna walk perpendicular to the road for the first, uh, I guess a couple hundred yards, or I don't know, 100 yards or so, um, just to get back into the wilderness area. This will now be the Sheephole Mountains Wilderness Area. And then once I'm pretty sure I'm in the wilderness area, I'll make a right turn, and I'm gonna head towards those mountains there. Yeah, there's that motorcycle. And I don't have to be quite as conservative with my battery now, because I have a charger. Although it's a newer model of charger that apparently only works with two of the batteries I have. So I still have to be a little bit careful about battery usage. But it's a lot better than having no charger, uh, which was the situation I was in until recently. Okay, and now we're going to turn and we're going to head towards the westernmost edge of those mountains. So these mountains, I think these are the northern end of the Coxco Mountains. Uh, and then these will be the Calumet Hills, or what I'm heading for. Um, mountains on the left are the Sheephole Mountains, I'm pretty sure. Well, that knoll I'm heading for still seems kind of distant. It seems like we're losing our sunset, or losing our sun, but on the plus side, the colors are getting real pretty. The pass is where I came from, around the corner of the Pinto Mountains there on the right, now in darkness. Starting to get some pretty colors here in the sky. Another progression in our colorscape. Still heading towards that knoll. Yeah, so you guys aren't gonna be able to see anything. But just to fill you guys in, so I've I've finally passed that knoll I was heading towards on the horizon. Um, and the place I really wanted to make my camp is actually three quarters of a mile further next to a different knoll. But the, the alluvial fan here has sort of a domed surface, so I can't see it from here. Uh, I don't I think even if it, I weren't using moonlight, I still wouldn't be able to see it. But according to my map, it should be just left of north. And I can see the pole star right now because uh, it's night. So I'm actually doing a little bit of celestial navigation and just trying to walk just a few degrees left of the pole star and uh, another three quarters of a mile out and we get to me to my ideal camp location. Well, here's where I ended up camping last night. Nice uh, place among boulders of the Coxcomb Granite Diorite. Um, I'll talk a little bit more about that in a moment. But right now we just, uh, we got a nice sunrise coming. Um, now actually I didn't mention yesterday because it was getting dark, but uh, for the last several miles now we've actually been walking across an enormous body of granites and granite diorites, you know, which are all loosely started out as, as a, as a you know, more or less a giant blob of magma under the ground uh, about 75 million years ago. So the Coxcomb granite diorite is part of a larger body of magma called the um, Cades Valley Batholith. A batholith is just a fancy word meaning a really big uh, body of uh, frozen magma. And in this case, the Cades Valley Batholith includes those mountains over there in light, or the Sheephole Mountains, the Calumet Hills, and then they extend another range over that way too. Um, and they cover over 2,000 square kilometers. Uh, and so, you know, we're going to be walking over this batholith for a while. We, I guess we're going to We've already been walking over it for a while, and we'll be still walking over it basically all day. So, um, uh, it was in place about 75 million years ago, uh, back during the time of the dinosaurs. Um, in all likelihood, it was, it was the roots of a, some sort of a super volcano, although the volcanic part has all been completely eroded away, so that's a little hard to say with certainty. As for why there was some sort of supervolcano here, the traditional explanation would again be volcanism above a subduction zone. Alternatively, there are some indications that these particularly large intrusions that are less than about 100 million years old may in fact represent the aftermath of a plate collision of a small continental fragment, the result of something called slab failure magmatism, when the dense oceanic plate broke off the more buoyant continental fragment. One problem with this theory is locating that collided fragment, which doesn't obviously show up 
in the southwestern United States. Um, one possibility suggested by geologist Basil Tikoff uh, is that it may be a piece of ground called the Insular Superterrain that has since moved up to Canada, matching up with the Baja BC hypothesis. And as for our route today, we're going to continue down uh, along the west side of the Calumet Hills here, and then eventually we're going to turn right and cross the Calumet Hills, uh, and then we're going to cross the Cades Dunes today. Here's one of these random rusted things you just run across in the desert. Not quite sure what it is from this distance. It's got rusty metal and wood. Looks like a uh, box bearing, but it's a uh, it's got a folding part. It's like a futon. Nice nickel spigot is still looking nice. Igloo, ten gallons, heavy duty. It can't be that old. Equipment probably for separating out ore or something like that. Probably they were. I'm not really a mining expert. Probably they were trying to do some sort of a plaster claim here or something in the gravels and the little canyons here. Towel saver. Huh. So they sort of random modern brands they don't expect to see finding resting out in the desert yeah so plaster gold is just gold left behind um in the bottom of a stream basically and especially because this is on a on a because it's on a pediment in particular is being cut down over time something heavy like gold might not move that far down the canyon so actually as the bedrock was eroded downwards the gold might not even make it that far down and it might sort of form a lag deposit of gold uh by lag deposit, I mean the, the gold is sort of lagging behind the rest of what's being eroded. And so it's not a bad surface to look for plaster gold on. It would be in the bottom of these canyons here. We're going to come around the corner of the mountain here. Um, and so these are still more of the Calumet Hills, and so we're going to go through that gap there. We've gotten a little further along now. We can see... Um, so the big mountain there that's white, that's Granite Mountain. I'll go over the right side of that in a few days. Beyond the high mountains to the right of that are the Providence Mountains. You saw those in the teaser video, if you watched that. Um, and then the mountains in front of the Providence Mountains are Marble Mountains, which I'll be walking on the back side of those in uh, five or six days. And then behind the gap I'm going through is the Ship Mountains. Uh, and then to the right of the Ship Mountains are the Old Woman Mountains. So that's actually where I'm hitting... I won't get there today, I'll get there tomorrow. Um, that's where my next water is, because there's relatively high mountain range, and so there's some springs in the Old Woman Mountains, and, uh, yeah, so Old Woman's, uh, is where I'm going to be spending the next few days. Okay, well, we've made it over the crest now of the Calumet Mountains. This is a weird plant. I've seen a couple of these now. I don't know what they are. They... They grow with a bunch of stems that come up together and crowd themselves into a knot at the top. Ah! A relatively deep hole there. <sighs> yeah, see, there's what they look like when they're dried up. Ah! If I don't fall in with a giant hole, I'll see you guys in a bit. <sighs> so we're still here. Here I am, close, getting close to where I'm thinking about having lunch. And um, we're still here in the Cades Valley Bathhouse, which again spans an enormous area. And here's an area where it's got, it's just chock a block with these potassium feldspar crystals. That's what all these big lumps are. It's, uh, well, I don't know if it's orthoclase or microhyme, but it's one of the potassium feldspars. And these big, like, four centimeter crystals, five centimeter, two inch crystals. Uh, there's a big one there, but basically these are all crystals that I've, um, a lot of the phases of this bath have them. This is one of the biggest concentrations of them I've seen. Uh, I'm going to actually take a sample from here because, uh, although I haven't primarily reached this, this, this particular bath of myself, this is a lot, a lot of people who've worked on this previously include, for example, the USGS, United States Geological Survey geologist, uh, Keith Howard. But I've, my, my, my students and I have worked on rocks of, of similar age and, and appearance. Um, 
So it's nice to have a, a sample or two for comparison. And I don't, I have one of most other phases of this bath, but I don't think I have this one, so I'll, I'll take a sample too. I will then take the sample and I'll drop it off when we cross um, Katie's road. Um, so I don't have to carry this with me for the next six days. And I can just come back and pick it up later. This one, if you watch the way it shines, this is actually a single crystal of potassium feldspar. Good, you know, eight, nine centimeters long there. One problem that <clears throat> I've been having that hasn't made it on the video yet because I've had the GoPro issues and then all my yeah, meals are dark is this bread was made on Wednesday, which I guess is four days ago now. It's not too stale, but it's a little stale. This bread was baked back in the um, Chakawala Mountains. You see, because there was no open campfires allowed in Joshua Tree National Park, um, I had to bake bread in advance. <clears throat> I also had a somewhat reduced ration. I accidentally used all of my flour. Uh, so the breads are also like super thick and stodgy because I had, I was using, you know, not quite 50% extra flour in my recipe. <clears throat> anyway, I have a new bag of dough now that should be ready for tonight. I'm leaving it in the sun just because in these cold nights, it doesn't really get much fermentation overnight. Re looking at the map, I realize I've already passed 300 kilometers about maybe three kilometers ago. Uh, so that's a new kilometer stone for me. Okay, so I just... Ah! The uh, burrow strikes again. Ah! Anyway, I think what I was trying to say was, I just need to keep going down to this valley, and then I think I make a right turn after the end of the mountains, and you can start to see the edge of the Katie's dune field out there. So yeah, basically right now, we're in the um, Sheephole Valley Wilderness, and then um, the dunes there will be in the Katie's Dunes Wilderness, and then the Old Woman Mountains are in their own wilderness, the Old, Woman Mount Old Woman's Mountains Wilderness, and there are gaps of a couple miles between all of those. And so I'm taking the path that shortens, takes the shortest distance. Um, now the Black Rocks there are the northern end of the Kilbeck Hills, which stretch off into the dust storm that's currently coming off of uh, Katie's Lake. And so I think I'm heading, I'm going across the dunes, then I'm turning and heading for those, and then heading to the Old Wind Mountains, I think the canyon that's actually even to the right of that. According to the GPS, I've now reached the edge of the Sheephole Wilderness. Um, you can see uh, there's a road here actually, about maybe 50 feet from where I stopped, uh, which is probably wide at the end of the wilderness. And so we have about a two mile wilderness camp from here. Uh, until the edge of the uh, Katie's Dunes Wilderness. Ideally, I actually got across the dunes today and part of the way towards the hill, over the dark hill over there. I think if you're if you're generous about the amount of time I walk on dunes, it's about six miles I walk across dunes. If you only count the like stuff that's like the stuff down there where it's big dunes without much vegetation on it, I have about two miles of that. Okay, so we're now entering a new landscape type. Um, and I got the winds cover on. I don't know if it'll do, but uh, anyway, we're entering a new landscape type now, um, which is, this is Katie's Dry Lake, or geologically we would call this actually a wet playa. Um, playa in geology doesn't mean a beach. It means a, uh, a flat lake bed, essentially, that only ever floods at a very thin layer. Because they only flood in a thin layer, um, they tend to be very flat because if the one part was deeper than another, then only the deeper part would get flooded. Um, and then, uh, you know, all the water would just go right there. But when there's an area where it, you know, just gets occasional big um, rainfalls and not enough to ever make a whole lake, uh, what happens is basically that the, every, every big storm you know, there'll be a few inches that will come over the playa, basically, um, and drop a little bit load of sediment everywhere, so that then it stays very flat. And as one part gets a little bit lower, then they'll get filled in a little bit more water, a little more sediment, and that'll tend to raise the flattest, the lowest parts up, so the whole surface stays the same elevation, usually within, well, usually within a few feet, sometimes within a few inches. Um, uh, and I call it a wet playa, so the surface you can see here isn't really wet. I mean, uh, 
but it's got this sort of powdery look to it. You know, some plies you'll see they have sort of a cracked um, sun-dried mud appearance. When it's got this sort of puffy surface to it, usually that means the groundwater is pretty close to the surface, and these, this puffiness forms basically as, as salts from the groundwater um, sort of percolate up and uh, crystallize into these sort of crusty crusts on the top, or powdery dust, depending on exactly what kind. Here they have some of both. Um, and so, on a wet fly like this, typically the, there, there, there's, there's groundwater, or in this case, a brine, relatively near the surface. And I don't think you can see it from here, but somewhere further to the south on this lake, there is, a, there is or at least was, a brine mining operation where they were mining salt out of the lake by basically digging trenches and letting them fill up with salt and then evaporating the sun to concentrate. It's sort of like trudging through snow. And it makes a similar crunching noise if you could hear it over the wind. I have to say, I'm starting to worry that I'm not going to get past those dunes before uh, sunset. So we're still a couple miles off to the near edge, and then I have to go across them for a couple miles. Well, the dunes might not be the worst place to camp. I'm not sure I'd want to camp in a dune active dune field during a windstorm. At least in the books and movies, you like seems like the sand will like cover you over you while you're asleep. I don't think that's necessarily true in real life. At least not with the level of wind we have right now. But and unless you camp someplace really dumb, like right at the bottom of a slope of a slip face of a dune. Well, we'll see where we get to. Can't do nothing but put one foot in front of the other. These funny little hills here, I think are just places where basically uh, plants have, have secured some wind blown material and the roots keep from blowing away. And so then as, as the wind brings more sand or mud chips, um, they get trapped in among the plants and grow bigger and bigger. They have a name, coppice dunes. They're a part of the ply that's studded with these white crystals. Uh, if you look at them up closely, oof. Oh, sorry, bending on the back is hard. You see they come with little plates. They're all dry and powdery. I think they're dry and powdery all the way through. Um, so based on the shape of the uh, the way these break up, here's a big one here. You see it has these, these parallel plates. These look like the crystal form of gypsum, which is calcium sulfate dot 2H2O. It's a hydrous calcium sulfate. But when it's super dry like this, it actually dehydrates and turns into a different mineral called anhydrite. And hydrite just meaning it doesn't have any water in it, uh, which is just calcium sulfate, uh, no water. So this, all these little crystally things sticking up out of the ground, like uh, I don't know, strange little uh, helix, strange little tombstones. Uh, these guys are all um, ex gypsum crystals. So we call these pseudomorphs. They're anhydrite pseudomorphs after gypsum. Pseudomorph is just when one crystal uh, has been replaced by a different mineral, but keeps the same basic shape. So I've now made it to the edge of the KD Dunes Wilderness. Well, I think we're starting to lose the sun. You see the dunes right over there. Goodbye, sunshine. Just as we get into the real dune. Goodbye. Well, now it's just me and you. You're not really even here. It's been getting a little dark here. I've been coming to this area full of dense brush. I'm getting close up here to the to the, uh, well, I'll call it the real dunes, but not there aren't dunes here under the vegetation, but the unvegetated dunes. Uh, so we're gonna be a little bit easier to walk on after dark. You know, I also don't like wading through brush in the dark. You know, the snakes should be hibernating right now, but you never know. It's nice to be able to see where your feet go. Nothing else you can't see uh, down at animal burrows. But okay, here we are out on the 
active dunes. Of course, I don't think the GoPro is quite going to do justice for gliding right here, but I think you can get an idea of. Jeez, oh, huh? Keep this. Sort to of get the sense of what I'm dealing with right now. Ooh, this sand is deep right here. One problem is there's blowing sand here. You probably can't see in this lighting, but and normally my sunglasses would afford some protection from the blowing sand, but can't really wear sunglasses right now. But it's not too bad. That's one reason I don't really want to camp in the sand dunes. Uh, I'm going to get sand in my food, sand in everything if I camp in the sand dunes. Especially these active sand dunes where the sand is always blowing around. At least it is right now. Whew. Well, let's see how far I get. Hopefully I can get past the sand dunes. You can see the remains of the sunrise. But I don't think the dunes are going to show up much. Well, I'm not sure I really like to be crossing dunes the other night, but it sure is beautiful. So I gotta give the credit for that. Well, the plus side of navigating dunes in the moonlight is uh, there's nothing to run into. The negative side is there are no, <laughs> you can't, there's no contrast. You can't hardly see what's what. The good news is at least I have a strong sense of direction. Um, and I have moonlight here. I know that I should be walking about 20, 20 degrees to the right of my moon shadow on average. And when I'm on top of the dune, I can see the skyline of the old woman mountains. I don't know approximately where I'm heading relative to that skyline. So. Well, I think I have two miles of these big dunes like this. So if I can get across that, maybe that will put me someplace where I can uh, set up camp. If there's something just a little bit freaky about being in the middle of a dune field at night, you know, you just, you should, it's like being in a cloud, you just can't see anything. I mean, you can see stuff, but it's all shades of gray. You know, it's hard to tell what's a hill, what's a valley. Hear that noise? Well, you can. That rumble, I think, from the direction it's coming from, is probably the California and Arizona Railway, which is a few miles past the end of these dunes. Strangely, it gives me like a hope that there's actually a world past the dunes, <laughs> and that if I keep walking far enough, I will get out of the dunes, which is sometimes feels a little hard to believe right now. Just every dune crest, there's another one. And again, especially, I've gotten this feeling before in dunes during the daytime, but at night, there's an especially acute sense of <laughs> being lost in the middle of the desert. I've been walking now for almost an hour and a half since it's been dark. I would like to get blowing sides, but I can't someplace that doesn't have blowing sand. <laughs> 